Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, after some break uh, from your midterm exams, uh, we are back to the rest of the semester, uh, continuing with the joint seminars by the department and um, Cyprus Policy Center. Um, today, we are privileged to host uh, Associate Professor Gunari Peck, who's a long-term friend and colleague. Um, Punar graduated from Ankara University uh, from undergrad, got her um, master's from Indiana University of Pittsburgh and PhD from uh, University of Pittsburgh. She worked long years in Bill Kent University and currently she is a professor at uh, top ETU University in Ankara. Um, Punar is one of the leading academics, scholars in Turkey, who has been engaged in energy uh, politics. And today she is going to um, talk about energy politics uh, with respect to um, Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, part of her presentation today is based on a joint paper, a joint journal article, an SSCI article she has uh, co-authored with. Um, what is the name again? Tibet Kür. Tibet Kür. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, but at the same time, she will be also talking about energy politics, the, the latest trends in energy on the global level as well as on the regional level, effects of the war in Ukraine on energy politics and whatnot. So I hope that um, we will make her um, presence and presentation here today much richer with your questions, especially during the uh, question and answer period. We are, again, privileged to have uh, Punari Peck with us today. So without further ado, I would like to turn the floor to Punar. Please. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to take also this opportunity to thank uh, Professor Ahmed Sözen and Eileen uh, Grab for uh, their kind invitation. I am honored to be here. Uh, this is my first time uh, on campus, East Mediterranean University. So as uh, Professor Sözen has underlined, and thanks for his very kind words about my expertise and research interests, uh, I would like to give the talk uh, today on uh, basically the energy politics regarding the hydrocarbon resources development in the East Mediterranean region. But uh, uh, the later in the second uh, part of my talk, I would focus also on the recent trends, changing dynamics, and what does it mean for cooperation or conflict in the region. Uh, so my uh, talk basically, actually first we'll quickly look at the how did energy politics in the East Mediterranean region begin begin and how can we understand and explain lack of cooperation especially regarding the East Mediterranean gas forum which uh, in which uh, Turkey Lebanon and Syria is excluded what has changed in the process and how so this is more the academic theoretically but empirically supported part of my talk. And then the second part would be more on policy implications, trends, that, what I call as the changing dynamics of the natural gas market and uh, expansion of renewable energy sources. And what does it mean for, as, we, uh, as I mentioned already, for cooperation and conflict in the, uh, at the current uh, times and perhaps in the uh, future. So let's very quickly remind ourselves major turning points regarding hydrocarbon resources development in the last two decades. As we all know, Southern Cyprus signed exclusive economic zone agreements with Egypt in 2003, with Lebanon uh, in 2007, with Israel in 2010. And then there was the tender for offshore fields in 2007, which was followed by the first drilling activity in Aphrodite field in 2011. So in response, 
Turkey concluded the Continental Shelf Agreement with uh, the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus in 2011 and later with uh, Libya in November 2019. So this is the legal framework of Turkey's uh, Foreign Policy Act. And of course we have to remind ourselves also the offshore drilling activities which are only the producing field right now in Israel and uh, Egypt. So the East Mediterranean Gas Forum was launched in January 2019 in Cairo, and it highlighted Turkey's exclusion from the, this new uh, regional institution. In September 2020, member states signed a charter and turned the East Mediterranean Gas Forum into an international organization. So. Um, uh, my, actually I should say our, uh, because this research uh, is conducted by uh, my master student at that time, Tibet Gür. Uh, he is right now a PhD student at Rutgers University in the uh, US. It was his master thesis data collection and later we turned it into an article which is just published on Turkish studies uh, in the first issue of this year. It was available online uh, since last year. So our research question concerns how additional mechanisms construct material interests in the lack of cooperation between Turkey and other regional uh, states regarding the uh, topic of the today. Our framing analysis, we did a framing analysis, demonstrates, and I will show the results soon, how Turkish, Greek, and Southern Cyprus policy discourses differ in cooperative and conflictual frames regarding the politics of hydrocarbon resources development in the region between 2010 and 20. We trace the ideational mechanisms of cognitive priorities and causal ideas, I will explain what these uh, mean, constructing material interests within the context of changing domestic politics, which explain the lack of cooperation between Turkey and the member state. So our argument emphasized the role of ideational mechanisms, which contrasts with realist perspectives that explain the emergence of this uh, gas forum through balance of power dynamics in the region. So there is a large literature that emphasizes rational cost-benefit calculations to explain politics of regional cooperation. Uh, the first group uh, is actually in the, what we know as in the liberal tradition, primarily consider material and political gains that states expect from the commercial uh, uh, relations. However, as we know and as we have observed, commercial incentives stemming from natural gas resources alone do not have the force to bring these countries together. Right? So the Cyprus problems resolution, being on Cyprus <laughs> today, is underlined as a geopolitical necessity in the different studies before actually a necessary infrastructure could be considered for cooperation. In short, natural resources driven regionalism in liberal studies fail to explain lack of cooperation. The second group of studies underline security concerns uh, in states' preferences about regional cooperation. According to these studies, new patterns of cooperation developed between 2011 and 20 were rationally driven responses to rising regional power status of Turkey. Uh, and also the leverage of American hegemony over the region's geopolitics is also emphasized to explain the changing patterns of alliances in this region. I am talking about these uh, tripartite right, uh, alliances between uh, Southern Cyprus, Greece, Israel, and Greece, Israel, and Egypt. So, uh, in short, these studies argue that a regional order has been shaped through external balancing acts, system level pressure, right, in IR theory, uh, in terms of in quote, clear threats and domestic filters between the systematic stimuli and threat perceptions of states in foreign policy behavior are important factors according to these studies. These studies, in the realist perspective, uh, concluded that Turkey's regional power seeking acts and rising assertiveness in its foreign policy have altered other literal states' threat perceptions and led them to balance against Turkey by 
forming the, what I just said, the trilateral partnerships. Our argument differs from these two group of studies. These studies do not consider the role of ideational forces in threat perceptions functioning as filters in domestic politics, which we uh, uh, consider and argue that it explains Turkey's exclusion from the uh, uh, formation of the uh, gas form between 2010 and 20. So the constructivist theoretical approach see interstate relations as a product of a historical process and interactions over time. For example, the historical distrust between two isolated communities on Cyprus and exclusion of Turkish Cyprus from international community has been an obstacle to a durable pattern of cooperation. Turkey largely maintained its cooperative discourse towards Greece and southern Cyprus until 2016, which I will show in a minute, despite the weakening incentives of Turkey's EU membership and the ongoing disputes about the delimitation of maritime borders in the East Mediterranean Sea. So this makes us to further elaborate why Turkey is excluded. So to answer how and which ideational mechanisms have constructed Turkey's material interest regarding the energy resources in the East Mediterranean Sea, we applied a framing analysis and then used uh, process tracing uh, for uh, foreign policy acts. So we generated a data set, which you can see in the tabular form, uh, with five frames. Uh, these five frames, as you can see, namely cooperative economy, conflictual economy, cooperative security, conflictual security, and sociocultural. Uh, the data set includes a total of 286 press releases and statements by Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Turkey, Greece, and Southern Cyprus, as well as related archived speeches of the Presidency of Turkey between 2010 and 20. Speeches referring exclusively to the hydrocarbon resources and or maritime jurisdiction, jurisdiction areas uh, are selected, right? Not all speeches. So one should note that uh, Turkey and actually uh, Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus do not have overlapping maritime disputes with neither Israel or Egypt. That's why we also included uh, Israel to our uh, analysis. Unfortunately, we couldn't include Egypt. If we, we know uh, Arabic, we could, but both the Arabic uh, website and the uh, posted, uh, uh, uploaded speeches were not reliable. They were not uh, steady or regular. So that's mm -hmm. why, why, unfortunately, Egypt uh, was excluded. Uh, okay, so we considered also the frames in Turkey's statements from 2003, although the analysis starts from 2010, for just Turkey, we look at the speeches also from 2003 because it was the first time Southern Cyprus signed the EEZ agreement. Till 2010, why 2010? Because it's the time when Turkey's bilateral relations with Israel turned into a diplomatic crisis. So that's why 2010 is our benchmark to trace any shifts in occurrence of frames in Turkish foreign policy elites uh, statements. So actually, uh, these uh, uh, figures are a better representation of understanding that tabular form. Uh, what we see here is the top part is, as you see, Turkey underneath uh, Southern Cyprus uh, and Greece. So uh, as you could see by the colors, the dominant uh, frame, the large section, is the light blue underneath for Turkey but much larger dominance, light blue, in South Cyprus and Greece. Uh, more in terms of uh, percentages, uh, Turkey's leading frame in this period between 2000 and 2020, conflictual security is only 28%. Whereas 52% is, the other colors, is cooperative security, cooperative economic interest, and social cultural. Whereas, when we look at Southern Cyprus and Greece discourse, 
For example, the most frequently mentioned frame for Southern Cyprus, uh, the upper left, uh, sorry, lower left part, conflictual security with 54%, conflictual economic interest is 29%, which makes total 83% conflictual. <laughs> okay, whereas Turkey was 52% cooperative. Greece followed a similar discourse, conflictual security with 58% and conflictual economic interest 17%, which makes the total 75%. However, as you could see, uh, uh, there are some breaks the 2011 because that year there was no uh, uploaded statements, but it doesn't change overall the discourse. We look through the uh, secondary resources. You see a shift in Turkey's foreign policy discourse. Uh, so we uh, try to understand why Turkey's foreign policy has changed sharply, as you could see here, from 2016 to 2020. In other words, why Turkey has been uh, co cooperative but uh, increasingly turned into a conflictual, whereas Southern Cyprus and Greece were persistently conflictual. Okay, so uh, we used Acharya, a scholar's theoretical framework, to trace the specific ideational mechanisms that constructed material interest in this regionalization process during the formation of the East Mediterranean gas form. Gas form. So there are three ways, actually, ideas and material interest shape politics of regional orders. This is one is cognitive periods. Second is causal ideas, especially during institutionalization process, in our case, the uh, gas forum, and emulation of exogenous ideas. So let me very briefly uh, define what I mean by this. First, cognitive uh, periods are simply pre-existing ideas of individuals and societies about the world and other actors. Thus, cognitive periods reflect how actors interpret intersubjective structures beyond rational calculations of cost and benefit. Cognitive periods are, in other words, pre-learned biases or core beliefs that determine the criteria for policymakers for understanding what a threat is or not in a security environment. Okay, so this is the conceptual definition. So in fact, given our findings, it demonstrates that the dominant conflictual security framing in Southern Cyprus and Greece's discourses persistently translated into a policy guideline through the entire period. Such pattern underlines the lack of mutual trust based on these cognitive periods in their relations with Turkey. We consider threat perceptions as cognitive periods embedded in historical narratives about state interactions rather than systematic stimuli. That's why we bring a constructivist argument. For example, historical narratives in the Southern Cyprus portray Turkey unchangingly as an aggressive and expansionist country since 1974. Indeed, in our coding, we did a latent coding, we have seen uh, phrases such as occupation force, illegal Turkish occupation of northern part of Cyprus, freeing Cyprus from Turkish occupation, being ravaged by Turkish invasion, and expansionist designs on the basis of its well-known behavior, uh, referring to Turkey. All these evidence show how the southern Cyprus policy elite persistently framed Turkey through a security conflictual lens between 2000 and 20. So when we come to shift in Turkey's policy preferences, we have to look at the redefined causal ideas. So let me define what I mean by causal ideas. This is the second ideational mechanism. So uh, uh, it is important to understand how actors' initial ideas, right, the already embedded cognitive periods, are redefined and uh, institutionalized, as we have seen in the alliance formation or uh, gas forum, formation of the East Mediterranean gas forum. So uh, the uh, causal ideas uh, describe how initial cognitive periods embedded in policy discourse are transferred or 
new ideas are introduced in the social construction of material and normative instruments to achieve these policy goals. Uh, as we have seen, there was an increasing frame of occurrences of conflictual security in Turkey's policy discourse right after 2016. So we argue that this shift in policy preferences of Turkey can plausibly explain by cognitive periods and redefined ideas, causal ideas, in Turkey's interactions with predominantly Israel, followed by southern Cyprus and Greece. So uh, Turkey's cooperative policy between 2003 and 2010 has been lost in the corresponding framing of conflictual security by southern Cyprus discourse towards Turkey. Further, Turkey's causal ideas were redefined when Turkey's sovereign rights, so material interests, were directly threatened by foreign energy firms drilling activities on behalf of South Cyprus in the contested maritime zones of the around the Cyprus island. So uh, we argue that Turkish foreign policy elite started redefining their causal ideas within the context of three interrelated developments. Number one, changing relations with Israel since 2008. Social and political movements in the region, collectively known as Arab, Arab Springs, Spring. since 2010. And the third one, changing domestic politics in Turkey after 2015 elections and the 2016 COP attempt. Uh, the third way, uh, ideational mechanisms, uh, is uh, actually the emulation of exogenous ideas. Why we use this ideational mechanism borrowed from Acharya's work? Because pre-existing beliefs are, and locally produced ideas, the cognitive periods actually, are the lenses through which international actors, ideas, and norms will be adopted. So the EU and United States involvement in conflict resolution initiatives in this region is considered as the third ideational mechanism. Uh, for example, in addition to the disagreement over disputed maritime borders, the failure of reunification talks on Cyprus, especially after Montana in 2017, and weakening uh, political relations between Turkey and EU, which was quite bold at that time, accelerated the shift of Turkey's uh, to conflictual security and economic framing, not only in Turkey's discourse, but we have seen this rise in conflictual framing also in uh, United, uh, European Union's declarations about Turkey. Thus, Turkey redefined causal ideas within the context of changing domestic politics, have rebounded into EU's conflictual framing about Turkey. This is the intersubjective structure of the process. So how, through the southern Cyprus and Greece's persistent cognitive biases, uh, regarding constructing their material interests about uh, energy politics. In other words, redefinition of causal ideas through deeply rooted nationalist discourses as seen through Turkey's shifting discourse from cooperative to conflictual reflect social construction of material and normative instruments in Turkey's ambitious and assertive foreign policy. On the other hand, the United States, right, the second actor for emulation of uh, exogenous ideas, uh, can be traced back to U.S. foreign policy uh, uh, policies ineffectiveness uh, since the Arab Spring in 2010, uh, 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 and uh, this has accelerated uh, when uh, there was a change in domestic politics since 2015 in Turkey, and indeed we have seen the. We have observed this as a series of political crises between U.S. and Turkey, uh, starting from uh, more boldly uh, after 2015 elections. To conclude, redefined causal ideas in Turkey's discourse were based on new ideas, such as Blue Homeland, or uh, well known as Mavi Vatan, reflecting strategies through the social construction of material interest, uh, instruments, for example, show and use of force, Turkish Navy, or, uh, and, sorry, and 
normative instruments such as President Erdogan's nationalist conservative discourse in Turkey's increasingly assertive foreign policy. So our find research findings confirm that ideational mechanisms under specific conditions socially construct the inclusion of us and exclusion of them in patterns of enmity and enmity uh, among the Turkey, Southern Cyprus, and Greece. So this brings us to uh, this point. When changes in domestic conditions and at the EU level facilitated the redefinition of causal ideas, deeply rooted nationalist discourses re-emerge in Turkey's uh, foreign policy. Uh, in other words, the role of the emulation of exogenous ideas should be reconsidered in light of the changing dynamics of the energy market during the economic recovery uh, after the pandemic and in the aftermath of the war ongoing right now between Russia and Ukraine. So uh, this is the, the end of my first part of the talk, which was based on, as I uh, presented, uh, uh, on the paper published, right, the theoretical and empirical part. But this brings us, these findings brings us to the question of what does these changing dynamics that I will briefly talk in a minute uh, mean for cooperation and conflict uh, for energy politics in the region? Uh, first, let me uh, uh, quickly remind you that the major trend actually in understanding a global energy market is electrification. What we mean by electrification, in the past, when there was an economic growth, change by technology, industrialization, most of this uh, energy demand was supported by fossil fuels. But more and more, service sector actually is the locomotive of the world economy, right? All these dot coms internet-based commercial activities and so on. So you, you know this better than us, right? So that means more demand for electricity, right? That's what we mean by actually, as you could see from the International Energy Agency's forecasts here, the, the, from the scenario from 2018 to 2040, the increasing future demand would be for electricity, not fossil fuels, right? So. This brings us to the question of energy transition. Uh, in light of the two uh, issues, climate change, which is a concern for all people living around the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, including all world citizens. East Mediterranean is relatively under more recent threat, uh, given the IPCC, International Panel on Climate Change, that we may expect extreme weather conditions and so on in this region, right? So that means we have to uh, focus more on how to produce renewable energy resources. And this brings us to the question of energy transition. But energy transition is an issue, uh, of course, for everybody, as I said, for world people. However, G20 countries bear a more responsibility for the obvious reason because they are the G20, they have the largest share in world economy, and they demand and consume more fossil fuels, right? So uh, this actually highlights the importance of the power, which brings us again the issue of electrification. Why? As you see here, fossil fuels are used actually 60% uh, of electricity needs including coal, 38%, natural gas, 20%, red, because it may mean something for East Mediterranean potential hydrocarbon resources, and oil, oil is very uh, few in uh, power generation. So uh, uh, further, we can see actually, uh, especially before the pandemic, there was an uh, increasing demand for natural gas. Right? It's, this is the uh, historical uh, era that I'm talking about when Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum has been uh, in the formation process. Right? China was the uh, energy hunger, 69% right? uh, increase its natural gas. I highlighted also Germany because within the EU, Germany is a large player for energy market. And overall, EU, EU's uh, natural demand was also increasing. So these countries are, the, or these regions, EU and China uh, uh, and Asia, but more specifically China, I underline more because these are the potential customers if 
Any hydrocarbon resources further development would be done around the Cyprus island. And this would bring us to the question of uh, price, uh, cost of uh, hydrocarbon resources development, as opposed to whether we should move into the uh, renewable sector, renewable uh, uh, power generation. And the, actually, energy sector makes up 78% of all greenhouse gas uh, emissions. So that means, very simply, we have to start actually from the power sector to cut uh, or to prevent climate change. Right? Uh, not the transportation, not the industry. First, power generation, because it's followed by industry uh, and then transport. And, of course, this brings the politics. Every country has a different path for their uh, ways of how to uh, uh, transit from fossil-based economy, what some studies call also as carbon-locking economy, to a green economy. Right? So you see all these uh, brownish to reddish colors are actually all fossil fuels by most G20 countries. Only the upper part is the greenish part. So we are in the beginning of the process. Although there is a sharp uh, increase in renewable resources, some countries have more greenish because they are lucky. This doesn't mean that they were more successful, at speaking of the moment, for wind and solar power generation, because they were lucky in their terms of their hydropower from rivers, like Brazil, if you see the yeah, largest. The, the uh, one next to the yeah. EU is, and I was trying to figure out uh, which one is that. Yeah, I don't know if any, everybody so yeah. uh, catch this one, which right. is the yeah. one sticking so, out. Uh, so it's the hydropower, right? So the, 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 the uh, geographical uh, resources uh, in terms of hydropower distribution also matter. Well, now, during all these uh, politics, tensions about hydrocarbon resources around the Cyprus island, as I mentioned, the major issue was the cost, right? How much to produce from this region if all the geopolitics is settled, right? If we start production. And then second, uh, once we start to produce, which region would buy our resources, these region's resources, right? And Asia was the target at that time for the, uh, uh, the same reasons. Compared to EU market, which was at that time, 2010 to 2020 I'm talking about, was mostly uh, supplied by mostly Russian gas, which was much cheaper because it was a pipeline gas uh, which the sun costs were already there. It has been there for a while. Additional pipelines added, so we, you know, we don't have to go into those details. So the, the price competitiveness of the cost of developing hydrocarbon resources in the East Mediterranean were not that uh, convincing. So that's why everybody was looking at the Asia, uh, targeting uh, China and Japan and Korea, which heavily imports uh, natural gas. But Two major developments changed the market dynamics. One is, as we know, after the pandemic, there was an economic recovery. And as you could see here, actually, this is a very nice chart. You see all these prices, and this is exactly the European natural gas hub prices, right? You see that they were all below the $10 per British thermal units when these geopolitics were tense. In other words, the, uh, the cost was, again, not convincing because the prices were lower. So more than 10 years, as you're saying, the price of the gas was basically less than $10 BTU. Exactly. Until and, and in some years, below even $5, as wow. you could see, yes, yes. Right? around 2010. Yeah. Exactly when actually the, most of the things started to get more tense, right? when drilling activities started, the price environment was not friendly, right? That's why uh, they were considering, oh, okay, if not EU, then where? Turkey or East Mest get by gas pipeline, right? All these alternative infrastructure uh, projects. But, but last year, there is a huge hike. Exactly. 2021, right. uh, so prices you, Yeah, spiraled. after the uh, pandemic, you see a huge uh, spike. Uh, spike increase, mostly uh, because of the low, uh, uh, supply, this is actually temporary, but lower lower storage during the pandemic, uh, most EU countries didn't fill, refill their uh, gas storage units, 
uh, when there was not much economic activity. Right? So this was a perfect storm for actually natural gas markets, speaking in economic terms, right? If I'm a business manager, this is how I would look at the energy market, right? Without geopolitics, this is how it looks. Uh, but then geopolitics kicked in as well. <laughs> what uh, we are referring, uh, this is another way of showing uh, both EU and Asian prices. Right, because what I just said, Asia was more uh, desirable for uh, a target uh, customer uh, region. Uh, and uh, as you could see, actually, Asian prices were uh, higher, uh, even during the low term, right? But then the same spice hike we have seen also in the Asian hub prices, unbelievably below $30. Whereas at some point, it was less than $5. This is, this is an increase that we haven't seen even during the oil crisis of 1973 or 79. So currently you are saying um, the gas prices are around 30, 35 BTU. Yes. Dollars per, per BTU. And what energy uh, experts uh, 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 highlight, indeed, in the upcoming winter or fall season, these prices might further escalate for the same reasons. Mm -hmm. There is already lower, low uh, storage units, and the second ex catalyzer, uh, in the negative sense, is the uh, political uh, discussions and willingness to reduce Russian gas. So if you want to reduce Russian gas, you will take a significant amount of gas out of the market. But what was the other one uh, in, in green? Um, what is called Henry Hub? Uh, that's the U.S. Uh, hub. Ah, yes, that's okay. the price right. for the U.S. Uh, uh, natural prices. This is the spot market prices, not the long-term prices, right. which the world also is moving towards. Indeed, steadily, both EU, even Turkey, were moving away from long-term contracts to LNG. These are mostly based on LNG, liquefied natural gas, right, which is uh, transported through ships. Indeed, to avoid any geopolitical threats, implications that because pipeline-bound gas may be used as an instrument, which we know as energy as a weapon, energy as a uh, foreign policy instrument in, uh, by like Russia, threat perception depending on, or uh, a problem in a transit country like Azerbaijan or Georgia. Or just and like Russia now cutting Ukraine. the supply to uh, Poland and Bulgaria. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, this, that was the case, right? So there's uh, three, three different regions pricing. But when a Russian invasion of Ukraine has started, there was another uh, uncertainty and volatility, very high volatility in the market. Because these spot, some of these spot prices are also future contracted. This is how financial markets works. So different companies buy gas of the winter from today. So when there was a panic, right, of, oh, what if Russia cuts the gas immediately? Mm -hmm. They were trying to contract very fastly and so on, right? That's why we see another uh, uh, hike uh, right during the uh, winter. So uh, that brings us to Russian gas. What if we want to get rid of the Russian gas? Which countries would uh, be more affected? And what does it mean for uh, a second window of opportunity, perhaps? A second, perhaps. Uh, but what should it be? This is also a discussion. Why? Because do we really want to invest in natural resources, or do we want to uh, move into renewables? Or do we need to mix both, and how? Right? So this is not just only energy, but the politics about these disputed zones given uh, offshore fields uh, in the uh, littoral states. So you see, uh, this is just for gas. I just focus on gas, not on oil, because uh, it's more related to East Mediterranean uh, region. So as you see, uh, Russia uh, uh, exports are uh, more important for EU than uh, other regions, including Turkey. Right? So for a, t for a while, actually, including Turkey, the, the EU countries were trying to move away from Russian gas. And indeed, during 2020, 2021, sorry, when the gas prices were hiking, uh, because of also the high inflation pressure, cost of political 
uh, uh, cost for uh, upcoming elections. Many European countries, including also Turkey, uh, heavily, and uh, China, moved to coal, which was cheaper for the higher price of natural gas, but that put, unfortunately, uh, more pressure on the climate change, given the carbon dioxide emissions are very high from the coal. However, Russia was actually, I will uh, leave this to maybe to Q&A, Russia was uh, actually uh, observing this uh, hesitation by EU countries about their trust to Russian gas, and Russia was also actually trying to diversify its markets, ideally, to Asia and through LNG, but not by using Bosphorus or the East Mediterranean Sea, so the Suez, the Arctic Sea. Again, unfortunately, because of the climate change. Right now, this is the first time, for example, last year in March, an icebreaker ship could uh, uh, navigate from the uh, northern part of Russia through the Arctic Sea to deliver a LNG to Asian market in March because of the melting ices. In the past, this was not uh, possible. possible. So that means, in other words, a new road, maritime road for Russia to uh, deliver its gas if Euro abandons its uh, market for Russian imports. An alternative, an alternative to Asia. And uh, energy hunger Asia is ready to import this uh, Russian gas. OK. Now, uh, so if we move away from Russian gas, that means, as I said, perhaps a second window of opportunity for the East Mediterranean gas resources. So here, then, we have to consider which countries are more likely to support this. And if we uh, uh, rationally think a correlation between the, the, the heavier dependence on the Russia, the more likelihood to move away from Russia, we see Germany, right? Italy and Turkey, right, and the others. Further, we see the roads, actually, that are, unfortunately, heavily dependent on the today's uh, war zone. Uh, Ukraine has the largest volume of gas. That's how it's delivered to Europe. So even uh, uh, Nord Stream runs, right, because, yeah, OK, let's think like a realist. We have strategic interest. I keep running the Nord Stream, but Ukraine may be off the table. <coughs> then, sorry. You have to keep, uh, you have to find about 80 BCM, right, uh, to replace Ukrainian uh, transit road. <clears throat> On the other hand, despite all these tragedies, sadness, and all these scenes, unfortunately, we, uh, with, with a big sorrow watch on TVs or Twitter and so on, the gas from Ukraine keeps flowing to Europe. I call this in very simple and kind words, tragedy. Right? I mean, despite all this big scene, uh, the gas keeps flowing. Right? They don't damage those infrastructure. But the gas that goes to Ukrainian system is cut by Russia. <laughs> yeah, this is how the system works. Uh, OK. Now, Russia, uh, while Russia's uh, war and the condemnation by all international community, almost majority of the members of international community condemns Russian acts, uh, international energy agencies submit a plan, a ten-point plan, to how to reduce reliance on Russian gas. This plan is, is especially for short to midterm. Right? Uh, so uh, I will just select number two and four because these are about natural gas and renewables. So number one, uh, uh, this is a policy advice, is that no new gas supply contracts with Russia. For example, Turkey is actually on the eve of a negotiation of its uh, all, uh, Blue Stream pipeline, a major pipeline, about 16 BCM to Turkey, the on nego renegotiation uh, uh, with Russia. Uh, similarly, uh, other European countries may have some long-term contracts that is due, that means need to be renegotiated, right? And the second option is, of course, uh, uh, alternative sources, alternative gas sources. So given the ongoing uh, production, the fields that are already producing, the immediate alternatives can come from 
as stated by international energy agency, Norway and Azerbaijan. So the question is whether this Mediterranean gas development would be rapid enough to bring that gas. We may discuss in the uh, Q&A session. But this uh, calculation is only bringing, as you see, 30 BCM for non-Russian gas. Remember the Ukrainian gas volume, 80 BCM. So we need more 50 BCM. <laughs> Right, so that means there is a potential and increasing perhaps demand and hunger for East Mediterranean gas resources. Uh, okay, who else could be the uh, other exporters of gas? This is basically the major producers of gas, but not all producers can export because they are also large markets like mm -hmm. US or uh, for example, uh, Iran. Iran cannot export gas at the moment, very few. So uh, if you exclude Russia, net exporters are uh, Norway, I already mentioned, Qatar, Australia. And all these countries can export via LNG. This brings maritime security. Yeah. Qatar has to go through Suez and pass through East Mediterranean, right? Uh, or Australia, again, uh, has to go through maritime borders. Uh, well, uh, that brings us the second alternative source, renewables, right? Uh, so we need to accelerate uh, deployment of new wind and solar projects, but in the short term, this can bring only six BCM. Uh, so that makes about approximately 40 BCM. We need 40 BCM more to replace only gas that goes through Ukraine, not to, to mention Nord Stream and others. Uh, there is the option of nuclear, we can discuss this later. So this has brought the world politics about not just East Mediterranean, but overall energy politics to a new, actually, uh, from an academic perspective, please don't misunderstand, I, I respect all, and I am very sad about all the tragedy of the war, of course, but an interesting uh, uh, empirical and research theoretical environment for IR students and scholars to question everything we know about international relations, how the future alliances would be, right? And not just military alliances, but also energy alliances that we can talk about. This is a study done by Andras Gauta and uh, his co-authors, Christian Westphal is included here, a German scholar. Mm -hmm. So actually, they have seen a four future scenario. How the, this, is, this was before the Russian war, right? Russian-Ukrainian war. Uh, so the, the most optimistic scenario is the upper uh, left corner, which is the big green deal. That means technology, price-wise, infrastructure, everything would be okay. There would be political commitment. We will rapidly move into big green deal. So uh, fossil fuels and associated geopolitics would go from the world scene, right? And the second scenario is, okay, maybe the political willingness for renewables would be not that strong because there are vested interests, right? Carbon locking, not just big energy firms, but please think about automobile industry. Uh, other steel uh, metal uh, related industries and agriculture. We also neglect actually the importance of natural gas in agriculture. Why? For fertilizers. Ammonia is produced either from hydrogen or natural gas and both of them can be either produced from renewables or natural gas and indeed Russia before the war has uh, uh, banned Export of ammonia, Russia is one of the major exporters of ammonia that is used in fertilizer production. So that means this natural gas crisis would, would have, I'm not saying might have, would have a, a significant implication for the upcoming food crisis. That doesn't mean that we will be hunger, uh, we will have uh, that kind of food crisis, but high inflation, food inflation, which is dangerous for populism, for upcoming elections in this part of the world. Which I will write, not just this part of the world, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and the third scenario is dirty nationalism, which might be maybe interesting to reconsider uh, in the aftermath of the Russian 
Ukrainian war. Why? For example, just from, again, an uh, economics perspective, uh, China and India are racing to contract relatively dropped prices of Russian gas or oil, right, fossil fuels, because of the pressure, actually, uh, some EU co companies, whatever, they have not been uh, in the future contracts uh, demanding Russian oil. So the Russian oil price actually, despite the increase in the overall price, specific Russian oil dropped, and China and India are contracting with uh, cheaper prices. Right? So that's dirty nationalism, dirty in the sense of because they keep relying on fossil fuels. Uh, that means a threat for climate change. And the uh, last option is the modeling on, meaning not with much change. This will be a slow and painful transition. Now, uh, I, I will not take a lot of time. I'll skip this part, and I will conclude. But uh, this conclusion is related to the last question that I asked after uh, presentation of my uh, research with my co-author, Tibet Gür. Uh, that the, uh, the question of what does this mean, what I just presented about the changing dynamics in the market for cooperation or conflict uh, for East Mediterranean uh, hydrocarbon politics, but also for overall, as I said, uh, energy politics. Well, uh, energy independence is a frequently word nowadays used by United States policymakers, European policymakers, politicians, and so on. But this, this is a, a misleading term because, for example, oil, you cannot, even if you have oil, the world oil pricing is based on commodity markets, which is quite liquid, not like natural gas, different. Or, again, you cannot be independent of natural gas, even you just have LNG, why more and more even long-term, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the move away from long-term contracts to short-term contracts or spot market prices, because of this volatility, the traders or the companies which sell natural gas include oil price in their uh, formulation of the natural gas LNG pricing. So that means, yes, you may have oil, but the cost of the oil would be also high for you. Okay? And second, shifting alliances, which I just explained, right? I gave some examples. So you might see a world of OPEC supporters, Russia supporters versus green supporters, right? Uh, that means we need to rethink energy diplomacy. There are new international organizations like IRENA, International Renewable Association, which is a new form of international energy agency, which was, uh, if you remember from your diplomatic history courses perhaps, uh, established right after oil crisis under the leadership of, uh, at that time, I think, um, United States, but who was the president? Nixon, maybe, 1973, would you? Yeah, yeah? International Energy Agency yeah. was published by Hegemon's leadership. But now we see many leaders, and actually this brings, brings us to second part. Renewables, and this will bring another alternative scenario for East Mediterranean geopolitics. Renewables do not necessarily require a top-down hierarchical order. It requires a regional order further, depending on where the most populated urban areas are, it requires more decentralized and actually cross-border cities alliances, urban areas alliances for sharing their grids, power grids. So it might not be the diplomats talking on the table about this is my zone, your zone, but because hey. Nicosia and Tel Aviv and Istanbul. Exactly. Or, uh, the, uh, or for example, the, uh, the cities, uh, indeed this is happening right now in Turkey. Turkey has been exporting electric city to Greece. Right? Yeah. So the uh, Thrace region of Greece is importing its electricity from Turkey. Whereas now there is all these expensive pipelines not to bring the electricity from Turkey, which is the cheapest way. <laughs> so uh, if the municipalities, the urban areas can uh, bring all the uh, regulations and of course necessary infrastructure uh, by companies and uh, financial resources, definitely a, con a condition, invested, uh, we may see regional, further regional integration through 
decentralized energy system based on renewable production. That's what I try to say. And this, this is encouraging for especially developing countries because most of developing countries, given their path to further development, uh, are uh, demanding more energy and they import. And they already have trade deficit, which is a big headache for Turkey. Uh, our la largest portion of Turkey's largest portion of energy, uh, sorry, trade deficit comes from energy prices, whether it's oil or natural gas. Right? So with renewables, you, you can reduce your trade deficit as well. So that's why there is, a, 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 in the liberal uh, argument perhaps, a win-win argument. Right? So this uh, brings us, as I uh, to conclude, the new geographies of trade shift from global markets to, as I said, regional grids. But this has a, 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 a I will stop here. This has a, some future food for thought for us. Why? I already mentioned it would be most likely in the future decentralized, but that means uh, indeed, this is a new term Hojam uh, used uh, in also policy-oriented or scholarly work, network communities. Mm -hmm. The future of network communities, network of internet, but now network of renewables, grids, grid sharing municipalities. Right? But this requires trust. And as we know, uh, Northern Cyprus cannot use the Southern Cyprus electricity, right? It's cut. No, Sometimes no. it works. Um, in fact, it is interconnected. Um, whenever there is a need, they are using it, actually. Ah, okay. And they pay for it. They, they find for, a way okay. to, to do it. All right. Yeah. All right, yeah. but uh, so uh, even uh, but, uh, the reason I uh, raised that question in my concluding remark because in, in an island there is definitely a necessity. Yeah. Uh, so actually, the, how the transmission system works is actually requires balancing. So if one side consumes more, it might be transmitted from the other side because the other side consume less, or because maybe they have more solar panels or other energy producing uh, 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 plants and so on. So that's why uh, there, there is a more need for uh, regional integration. And considering the climate change, uh, East Mediterranean, not just Cyprus, Turkey, but all coastal states can offer more to Europe to replace Russian gas and to lessen the uh, pressure on the climate change related extreme weather uh, threats. So thank you for your attention. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much for a um, very uh, insightful, wonderful um, presentation. Um, indeed, my um, wish from you, in addition to the paper, to talk about the current um, energy trends in the world as well as its reflections um, regarding uh, uh, after the or, or the effects of the war in Ukraine. I think it's right on the uh, uh, money. I think that there are some questions here, but uh, before turning the floor to you, I'm going to exploit my position and ask the first question. Um, it seems like a lot of scholars as well as think tankers, uh, policy-oriented people are saying that um, what we should expect from natural gas, especially hydrocarbons, uh, that they should be thought as a transitionary products, but we should aim for um, renewables, that maybe in the next 10 or 15 years, natural gas will continue to be important as a transitionary product, but after that transition, meaning 20 something years from now, uh, we will be de definitely going more uh, green, going more uh, renewable. Now, what you have not, you touched upon it, but not uh, um, in detail. In this transitionary period, if we see natural gas as a um, important transitionary product, where do you place US shale gas, mm. which 
I don't know how many of you know, uh, it's also regarded as the rock gas, Kayagaze uh, in Turkish. Uh, I know that maybe not a huge amount, but even Turkey started importing shale gas from the United States in order to substitute it's Russian gas or as an alternative. Of course, it's, it's not huge, but where is it when it comes to um, energy markets, the, the American shale, shale uh, gas? Right. Uh, actually, it might be also in this graph. Uh, I'm just checking. Yeah. Uh, indeed, if we have seen this picture, this table, uh, like 10 years ago, we wouldn't see US as a net exporter. Now we see U.S. as a net exporter with 54 BCM because of just what Ahmet Hoca said, this uh, so-called shale gas revolution. Uh, just for students who are not familiar with the subject, it's basically a new technology uh, for drilling because, you know, there might be very difficult rock formations that uh, vertical drilling uh, may not necessarily uh, go through the heavy uh, rock uh, formation. So. Uh, shale revolution is basically based on horizontal drilling. Uh, when I explain this, it looks very simple, but technically it's very difficult. So it's like a L-shaped drilling that can go underneath uh, that rock formation, which uh, doesn't need to go through vertical. So they uh, now reach uh, uh, before very costly uh, gas resources, and they have been producing that. Uh, so that changed the, actually the gas market mm -hmm. and that made US an important player also for the LNG trade, obviously because US is far away from Asia and Europe. Uh, so indeed, uh, uh, when we look at uh, Turkey's gas imports, Turkey has started reducing its dependence on Russia uh, by two sources. Uh, US shale was important including uh, not just U.S. shale, but also the LNG that Turkey had long-term contracts with Algeria, mm -hmm. which Turkey just renewed, uh, and um, a little bit from uh, Nigeria and also from other spot market. And the second major source was the expansion of the, Azer uh, the gas coming from Azerbaijan, the TANAP gas pipeline. So LNG, uh, 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 LNG volume and uh, new additional sources from Azerbaijan reduced Turkey's Russian uh, gas dependence uh, in 2018 to, uh, into in 2018 it was about about 50 percent mm -hmm. to uh, less than 30 percent. However, it increased again to 43 percent just last year for the same reasons that I just explained. Yeah. High gas prices, yeah. Russian gas is cheaper, and we already have sunk costs of the pipelines. So Russia is ready to feed in cheaper gas to the market, to flood the market, exactly the right word. Uh, but despite that, US LNG have played a critical role. Uh, Turkey is uh, among the, uh, after Asia, one of the largest markets for US LNG. And of course, the US foreign policy diplomatically would remind this also uh, to at least uh, not uh, necessarily, of course, enforced because is the, in the United States, these are all private companies. Private companies decide where to sell, how much to sell. Uh, U.S. Uh, diplomacy have no means of uh, saying anything, intervening into that, unless there is a political sanction. Like in the past, Iran uh, sanctions, Azeri gas couldn't go through the Iran because of the sanctions, yeah. infrastructure, right? Unless there is such thing. Yeah, in, in U.S. market, uh, politics do not intervene in uh, what, uh, where the gas goes, how it is produced, and so on. But as I just mentioned, it can be a convincing, a reminding tool, hey, uh, I can be an influential player uh, to balance uh, replacing uh, Russian gas. Uh, Qatar uh, is a, another important yeah. player in that sense because of their, uh, again, already established capacity to produce, and they're already actually uh, producing to export via LNG. Uh, Qatar doesn't export via any pipeline. And uh, in indeed, EU is in heavy talks. There was just recent news about Qatar. Qatar is also willing to do long-term contracts uh, because buyers would like to have long-term contracts. 
to uh, make sure that their investment is uh, supported by a long-term demand. Yeah. Uh, that, that's the formula perhaps for uh, the potential development of resources also in the East Mediterranean sources. I, I hope this yeah, could be an definitely, answer. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Yes, I'm opening the floor for your questions. Uh, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Um, well, given the recent developments, uh, do you see a prospect of transformation in the conflictual relationship in the Eastern Mediterranean in, uh, with regard to the energy um, considerations? And in connection to that, um, how do you see the future of the uh, East Map gas form? Um, we know that the U.S. also, you know, announced that it will, it will not going to uh, support, um, you know, the eastern, uh, the East Map gas form and the construction of uh, pipelines, but instead the interconnectivity of electricity uh, grids and so on. Shall we go yeah. one by one? Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, I thought it would come up in the questions, and uh, I, I left it in the end. Uh, well, uh, indeed, there are already talks uh, by the existing members of East Mediterranean Gas to include renewables, and uh, this will add into an interesting conflict resolution instrument, if I may. It's not my area. Amit Hoja is the expert, of course. Uh, for bringing these smaller markets, especially around Israel, like Jordan, uh, Lebanon, right? These are small markets which do not necessarily uh, convince big firms to invest in expensive offshore drilling and uh, production. Expensive relative to, as I said, already producing fields and uh, Russian gas. So uh, renewables are considered uh, and as you said, uh, there was this white paper, so-called by U.S. Embassy uh, of Athens, that is clearly stated East Met gas is no longer supported by the United States. And as you said, indeed, uh, on Monday they had the trilateral meeting between U.S., Greece, and Israel. Uh, Foreign Minister of Greece, Dan Diaz, uh, 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 also touched upon the ongoing importance of Greece for energy security of Europe. And it, he said, in my opinion, I am not sure, of course, uh, in my opinion, uh, East uh, Eurasia Interconnector, right? Eurasia Interconnector follows the road of the East Met gas pipeline, which is canceled. What does it mean? Well, uh, East Met gas pipeline couldn't work because of the disputed maritime zones and especially Turkey's strong stand of its continental shelf. So if it will follow the same road, okay, let's produce the power from renewables, but if we want to transfer it to Europe, then it has to go through again the disputed zone. So uh, we'll see. I think more action is waiting us. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, for electricity, as I said, rather than this, uh, in the end, rather than this expensive uh, is Eurasia interconnector, uh, decentralized regional hubs uh, that avoid uh, the undersea uh, seabed pipelines uh, might be uh, the uh, uh, major uh, reality uh, by the market and by the politics. However, they may use it uh, in the political discourse. Uh, so technically, how, how is it alternative? I mean, um, you're saying that um, smaller networks, right. how are they technically? Well, uh, speaking of islands, uh, it's a difficult issue. Mm. Uh, because Cyprus is uh, closer to Turkey, yeah. uh, but yeah. difficult, to fr different from, uh, I mean, sorry, more um, uh, distant from other coastal states. Yeah. But let me uh, think about the example of the already ongoing plan of Greece with the Asian islands. Okay. So Greece has already invested heavily. The first phase is already con uh, completed. Uh, they, it connects the islands to its grid system, 
These are uh, initially the islands that are not disputed again. Unfortunately, we have another dispute of the agency between Turkey mm -hmm. and Greece because mm -hmm. of, unfortunately, these beautiful islands, mm -hmm. <laughs> which there are hundreds of them, <laughs> between Turkey and uh, uh, Greece. Uh, the issue, uh, the students would know, but just to make clear, the issue is not about the islands. The issue is about the maritime borders, right? So the international waters and so on. Uh, so. Uh, this part closer to the uh, Greek mainland is interconnected. What does interconnection mean? Actually, there is more investment to these islands specifically on renewables and specifically on, depending on the island, like the mm -hmm. northern part mm -hmm. close to that, Danels, yeah. Çanakkale, uh, wind or solar. I see. Okay. But depending on actually uh, the, the, the biggest disadvantage of renewables, as you may know, is the intermittency of these in renewable sources. Yeah. What does intermittency mean? Well, this is engineering, which yeah. I also learned since I have mm -hmm. started <laughs> researching on energy politics. Uh, very simply, uh, any transmission system, a uh, power grid network, should have a certain base load, yeah. a voltage that means, right? It cannot go above or uh, 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 below it. If it is especially below it, the whole system goes down. So uh, that means when there is no sun or wind, if all your transmission system is on these renewable sources, unless you have a storage system, yeah. the system will collapse, right? And uh, that means also if these islands are invested more on renewables, which Greece is knowingly do that, but because if it is interconnected to the mainland, then there is not enough power on those islands, they may be fed with the other uh, power that is produced from whether natural gas or hydropower or maybe nuclear, yeah, if any, yeah. in the mainland, yeah. right? And given abundant gas and wind in those islands, which are some of them are very small, very less populated. That means a lot of it produced solar and wind is not consumed. So if it is interconnected to the mainland, the higher demand in the mainland grid may keep uh, consuming more and more from the islands. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a technically feasible design, what I'm trying to mm -hmm. say, mm -hmm. to achieve renewable uh, power generation. Uh, uh, but uh, for this part of the world, <laughs> again, uh, as I said, uh, the smaller markets of Jordan, Israel, uh, Lebanon, in the future, I think would have this kind of uh, infrastructure quite soon. So based on what you are saying and based on the SWP's um, hmm. policy paper mm -hmm. that our mm -hmm. friends um, written, what they are saying is the future of uh, Eastern and Mediterranean will be basically based on um, producing electricity, electrification as you put it, not from natural gas, but producing electricity from renewables, solar, um, wind power, or hydrogen, in this region, in mm -hmm. Eastern Mediterranean, and basically exporting that through an interconnected grid to Europe. To Europe. Uh, let me add two things yes. on this. What, what, I, I agree with what you said, but I think there are some conditionality there. Mm -hmm. the, the two conditionality I think of. Uh, one is uh, no new infrastructure, as I mentioned, especially that goes under the seabed. Right, that means more geopolitical tension. But existing natural gas producing fields would continue. And indeed, they might be, as we said, the transition resource. So no further investment, but existing producing fields like Egypt, Zor, yeah. or Israel's offshore fields, or even Aphrodite, because the Aphrodite section doesn't, again, the, 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 the production site doesn't overlap with neither uh, Northern Cyprus or, or Turkey's Turkey. continental yeah. shelf. Not the other blocks, but just I'm talking about Aphrodite. Uh, so that, that, that is feasible, and indeed, once once a natural, and we know that there is already a new pipeline that goes from Israel to Egypt. Why to Egypt? Because Egypt already had two LNG terminals. 
That means again, sunk cost. And indeed, yeah. one of its LNG terminals was idle in the past. I don't remember which one, I confused. There is uh, the Itku and uh, the Miatu. Why? Because remember those lower uh, LNG prices? It wasn't feasible to use that LNG terminal in the low price environment. It was five dollars, but now it's 35 dollars. Right. right, so they are using both action. terminals now. Yeah. So that means actually this new pipeline that is uh, uh, connected uh, Israel to Egypt, which there is no uh, problem in terms of uh, maritime borders. Indeed, right now, actually, this is not very well uh, uh, clearly stated uh, for the obvious reasons that I will just say. Uh, some of the gas that Lebanon or uh, Jordan uses comes from Israel. But once it goes in a pipeline to an uh, Egypt hub, right, the molecules do not have nationality. Exactly. <laughs> right? Exactly. So, once and in it stops it, being an Israeli gas and it exactly. becomes uh, Egyptian And even gas. this is the case of the pipeline gas I'm talking about. Once you turn it into an LNG, exactly. definitely it becomes just a molecule. And indeed, this was part of long term plan of US to turn this pipeline bounded gas market to LNG market because of this liberal idea. Once you have make it like oil, a market that, because for a commodity market, you need liquidity. Liquidity means availability, enough availability, and it can be uh, moved quickly around. And given the price environment, necessary infrastructure, and so on, the conditionalities, LNG has these uh, satisfactory conditions. So actually, I do uh, say this as my policy advice in different circles. Turkey can import any additional gas produced from this because we want to also diversify Russian gas. We need more gas. Remember also we want to increase renewable but as a transition and remember the uh, importance of gas for fertilizers, right? So uh, any gas from Egypt via LNG terminal to Turkey's hub and Turkey has created a hub, trading hub, spot market and given uh, the large market of Turkey as a major consumer gives an incentive to international firms, big firms, because Turkey can kick in in the spot market once the prices are very low to put the prices up. Mm -hmm. right? How? By providing, if not long-term contracts, because long-term contracts, depending on the formula, might be a disadvantage for the buyer country. But if it is a mid-term contract, it would give an incentive for the investing company producing in the offshore fields already, right? And uh, given the uh, fluctuations, volatility mm -hmm. uh, in all these uh, Russian war and uh, recent price hikes in the natural gas market, more uh, durable uh, pricing for the firms so that they can continue to produce and exactly. invest. Yeah. Thank, you. Uh, thank you very much for this um, very insightful presentation. I've learned a lot. Um, I have heard from some friends uh, that Israel, I mean not Israel, but the United States were, these experts were advising Israel to export their gas to Asia rather than Europe. Mm -hmm. So have you heard about that? Oh, I don't know, but uh, that, that can be uh, the uh, price and cost uh, balancing uh, idea. Uh, I was very, like, the one, very one, uh, uh, about this. Right. I never thought about it. I never thought it was a good idea. But this was like... I'm not shocked, actually. As, as I mentioned, yeah, but I, I don't think there is something to be shocked there. Why? Um, I understand why you say shocked, given the current context. Oh, sorry, sorry, I don't know. Yeah, of course, yeah, I'm not an expert on this. No, no, now I mean, uh, I mean, I mean why you ask them, I, 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 yes, yes, I agree. I agree. Uh, hmm. If it is an advice in this current context, what I mean by the current context, high price and the political willingness to replace Russian gas, yes, it is weird, mm. if not shocking. Mm. But if it is a political advice to convince the 
uh, both firms and to keep using it as a conflict resolution instrument, it is quite wise because, again, the higher cost of LNG uh, uh, produced from these offshore fields in this region is higher than other regions. Mm -hmm. So uh, who can afford that higher cost? Asian market. Uh, that, that, that's probably the reason. So uh, about the high volatility in the market, you know, of gas price and the war in Ukraine and uh, Russia, as Russia being the main uh, transporter of gas into Europe, right? Uh, do you think that there in the future, all right? Do you think that there is going to be a price war? You know, in, there's there going to be, be a price war. A, a price war. Oh, you know, of natural, uh, of uh, Russian gas mm -hmm. and the American uh, LNG into the European market. And because uh, Russia is going to transition into the Asian market very soon, based on the mm -hmm. uh, example you gave, uh, through the Arctic, mm -hmm. you know, the uh, mm -hmm. Russian ship moving through the Arctic. So later on, mm -hmm. is there going to be a like, price war between the you know Russian gas and the American LNG, you know, natural gas natural gas. And what do you think is gonna be the Russian defense strategy in the long run? Mm -hmm. Well interesting question, thank you. Um well, I'm not an economist and I'm not definitely a, you know, like market expert for pricing, but uh, in the context of my understanding of the market dynamics with uh, politics, uh, we may consider that kind of a potential price war or uh, rivalry, let's say, uh, for Okay, let me put it this way. There is an uh, already ongoing, actually, that kind of a war for the oil market, yeah. right? And interestingly, the, uh, this is OPEC, but within the OPEC, mostly Saudi Arabia. Why? Because it has the uh, spare capacity, uh, very similar to, let's say, uh, just to uh, make it uh, uh, capacity uh, clear, Qatar, right? Because it has a lot of gas and it has the capacity. It is ready to export once you have the LNG ships ready in its terminal, right? Uh, so Saudi Arabia has that kind of capacity to produce, uh, uh, increase its oil production and so on. So there was that kind of a war indeed between the US oil producers, shale oil producers, because shale is both oil and gas, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and unfortunately shale, uh, Oil uh, is, uh, I say, unfortunately, from the geopolitical perspective. Otherwise, from the customer perspective, I should say no, <laughs> uh, because we want cheap energy prices, right? Um, uh, it is. It should be uh, the cost break point for U.S. oil is uh, 60 U.S. dollars per barrel, 60 U.S. dollars. And there were times even before the pandemic the oil prices were much lower. So that meant, that meant a lot of the, some of these uh, shale oil production fields were uh, shut down or the dropped their capacity. Some of them were heavily debted. Uh, that means either they would be uh, merged with a bigger firm who could buy it, mm -hmm. but given if there is enough, uh, uh, enough demand, demand and price. But then there we had the pandemic, which stopped the that kind of a price war. In short, at that time, Saudi Arabia was knowingly overfloating the market to reduce the share of actually US oil yeah. uh, producers as well. And Russia was supporting that. But Russia has a disadvantage, both for oil and gas, both for oil and gas compared to Qatar or Qatar for gas or Saudi Arabia, what is it? Because its producing fields are in cold zones, the geography. So uh, once they shut down a drilling uh, well, it is very costly for them to restart, restart it. Yeah. Yeah. In the Middle East, it's not like that because it's uh, easier geographical structure and the weather is nice. 
right? Nice. A nice Sometimes in a sense. Nice. <laughs> 50% centigrade. Yeah. yeah, yeah, depends. Nice is a yeah. Yeah, relative term, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that means uh, to conclude, uh, to answer your question, we may see it not in terms of, in my opinion, for gas for market share, like I said, between Saudi Arabia and US oil producer, but for geopolitical reasons, again, uh, so we have to look at closely to this, what was the new name for uh, this new alliance between Australia, uh, India, and Quad. New Zealand? Quad? No. Quad. Like it's like Q, A, U, D. Quad, exactly. Quad, Quad. yeah. Yes. Uh, the, the Quad countries might be uh, uh, right uh, supported by U.S. oil, however, sorry, sorry, U.S. gas. But again, I, I think U.S. gas would more matter for EU. Why? Because there is Australia there. Mm. Australia is a, also a major producer right now. It, these are the uh, numbers of 2019 provisional. This number increased because Australia already uh, made investments for more offshore production for mm. natural gas. And it's encouraged because Asia uses heavily coal. So natural gas is still in need to replace coal. It's better in terms of carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, so the, like the uh, Japan, South Korea, the Quad countries would like to receive Australian or US LNG gas uh, given the uh, uh, these new uh, scenarios for alliance formation around energy politics. Thank you. We'll take one more there. Okay. Yes. So I'm curious about the battery technology mm. that is being developed. I heard that Elon Musk has already mm. built a, a facility in Turkey. Mm. And what do you think about mm. the future mm. uh, of that? Right. Yeah, it's very important uh, for uh, uh, storing renewable energy sources, which I just explained because of the intermittency problem. Uh, there is actually a technological race, yeah. and there are uh, uh, really very different technologies on the uh, table, both at the R&D phase, but some of them are very close to the commercial phase. Some of them are already commercial because we use them, as you know, in electric vehicles, mm -hmm. right? Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, there are some alternative ways of actually not just renewable solar and um, uh, wind, but uh, different uh, high-tech procedures uh, for electrolysis, which I explained to Ahmed Hoca during our coffee talk, hydrogen. Uh, for so hydrogen. Yeah. Uh, because hydrogen is a key essential for industry mm -hmm. uh, and agriculture. Uh, steel industry, these heavy, uh, these industries, steel, cement, uh, tiles, right, use actually heat. And heat is difficult to, the calories, the high calories is difficult to produce from solar and wheat immediately. Yeah. It, it should be mostly either natural gas or hydropower uh, supplied electricity resource. So actually they, they, they focus a lot on these industries for new, uh, technologies for electrolysis to produce hydrogen, not batteries. That's what yeah. I'm trying to say, uh, right? So that they can produce hydrogen uh, with different uh, electrolysis mechanisms As to avoid source. also uh, uh, this intermittency problem or battery problem of storage for renewable. On the other hand, the battery cost declined very uh, much. And there is indeed a really race, if not a war, really market race for how to uh, produce batteries cheaper, how much economies of scale, and where. Yeah. Because of the pandemic, uh, these intra-industry trade, these production networks of what we call as global supply chains learned a bitter lesson actually. Uh, because all these uh, supplies coming from China was disrupted during the pandemic. So some of the supply chains are right now relocated. Some of them are moving uh, back to Europe. And Germany, for example, allowed, uh, you know, they have strict environmental rules and so on. Uh, 
uh, for uh, battery production uh, and for some uh, renewable energy sites. Or Which even we, uh, uh, talking about the nuclear continuation of the nuclear. Exactly, power that's another uh, in, policy in discussion. Yeah. yeah, yeah, nuclear phase out. They decided actually to uh, turn on the uh, uh, closed nuclears that, that are still safe, but because of the decision closed, uh, while they replaced the Russian gas in the intermediate term. I say intermediate because they said in the future they don't. They are still committed right. to no nuclear. Yeah. Uh, for, for Germany, uh, yeah. I think we have exhausted all the questions, but I, I, I have the last question. If you can go back to those four scenarios. Ah, uh, sure. Um, which was about um, um, uh, renewable yeah. versus... Yes, yes. Um, Dirty nationalism, yeah, yeah. yeah, this one. Um, I, 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 I would like to hear your take regarding... Um, Based on your analysis, mm -hmm. which one among these four, or if you have maybe an alternative to mm -hmm. this, what would be your um, learned um, mm. um, forecast? forecast? Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's very difficult to make forecasts in social science, as we all know. Yeah. Well, so there, there's no free lunch. Yeah, so p please, uh, if I say something very ambitious, don't uh, make fun of me in the future. How oh, Pnaro just said this and the opposite happened, so this can happen. And actually, I'm not a person likely to make predictions clearly much. I am always on the hesitating side. But speaking of that, it's a fair question. Uh, uh, my uh, guess, my forecast uh, prediction would be uh, mostly a scenario between the technological breakthrough and modeling on. Mm -hmm. I think uh, dirty nationalism is the least likely. Uh, this might be the scenario right now or uh, in the near future, yeah. but the reason I, uh, my, in my prediction at least, in my opinion, in my prediction, clearly uh, take out the dirty nationalism is the growing uh, mm -hmm pressure by civil society, and I would say already a strong normative context by different people almost existing in every country that opposes fossil fuels, that opposes uh, these uh, uh, crazy consumption patterns based on carbon lacking. In short, climate change concerns. There is a growing consciousness about a green economy, environmental friendly way of living. So the world society is actually, the future of politics is also based mm -hmm. on this. But that doesn't mean that uh, everybody is on the board. Mm -hmm. uh, because of ongoing poverty, uh, social grievances, uh, inequalities, there are people who are just uh, resisting to survive forget about the right, the, what is the price of this and that. Uh, or uh, some countries, because of their leadership and their industries like China and uh, attached em employment concerns to that, uh, have to rely on fossil fuels. And actually, we shouldn't just blame China. Please also consider India. India clearly said no. Hold on, nowhere in the Glasgow conference, mm -hmm. yeah. they said, "Sorry, I cannot be a net zero uh, emission mm -hmm. by 2050." They said 2058, if I remember correctly. Eight years more said because, right, they are the largest producer of coal. They, most of their uh, power generation, electricity generation, comes from uh, coal, and it's a huge country, right, like China. And they said, "You look, I have to give employment, cheap energy prices, and so on." So uh, those are the necessities, unless, unless a, a, a major financial, financial support for this energy transition is supported by G20 countries, or G7 countries, I should say more specifically. Yeah. And this was also the part of the uh, talks during the Glasgow, actually. But with this high inflation environment in the global politics, it's not promising. Um, yeah, you don't want more liquidity in the market, so it's a complex picture in that part of financial right. uh, dimension. Well, what I would say is that um, I would like to thank for a, um, a 
not a free lunch, but a um, well-earned lunch uh, <laughs> from Punarajan. Please join me in uh, having a uh, strong applause for Thank you for this wonderful presentation. Um, yes, thank you, everybody, who yep. uh, spent time in this afternoon for us. Thank you very much for your this invitation. It was a pleasure to have your questions and to be Bojan, with you. What we usually do is that we give a present to all oh, the presenters. I'm spoiled. And it is the poster <laughs> of this event. So. Thank you very much. Teşekkürler. Uh, My pleasure. Çok teşekkürler.